Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Rowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know it's been another jam-packed month, as always. I think by the time November comes to an end, we'll have hosted 50 to 60 live events this month, connecting classrooms with scientists, adventurers, explorers, and conservationists uh, all across North America and beyond. So you can visit the website here, exploringbytheseat.com. You can find all the events still coming up for November, sign up, register to tune in live or view them afterwards. Uh, and then our December events will be launching shortly as well. Then we'll take a little pause uh, for the holidays. So uh, this week's also a special week. We, for the first time, have celebrated a World Fisheries Week. Uh, World Fisheries Day is coming up uh, on the weekend. Uh, and so we wanted to take a moment to connect with uh, fishery scientists, fisheries researchers, and learn about the amazing work that they're doing coast to coast to coast uh, in Canada. So we've teamed up with Fisheries and Oceans Canada to do this, uh, and we've had a great series of events uh, all week long. And uh, we're going to wrap up with a really fun one today, exploring the Arctic with Kevin Hedges. So Kevin has been a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada since 2010. Uh, he studies Arctic marine fisheries and invertebrates. So through his research program, he gives uh, science advice to resource managers to support the sustainable management of commercial fisheries for things like the Greenland halibut, northern and striped shrimp, and he also helps develop new community-based fisheries uh, in Nunavut. So he's also a member of the Ocean Tracking Researchers, uh, sorry, network, and that allows him to work with network researchers to study movements and habitat use of things like the Greenland halibut, the Greenland shark, uh, and the Arctic skate. So I'm going to bring Kevin in with us right now. Hey, Kevin, how are we doing today? Good. How are you? Good, good. Well, Kevin, it's so great to have you with us. Uh, the Arctic is definitely a subject uh, on the mind of a lot of educators and students right now. And as I was talking to you before we went live, I'm wildly jealous of you getting to work with Greenland sharks. That's pretty darn cool. They are interesting. That's for sure. All right. Well, Kevin, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit, uh, and then we're going to bombard you with some questions. How does that sound? Sounds great. All right. Here we go. Okay. Let me try to share. Looking good so far. I see it coming up backstage. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so yes, um, my name is Kevin Hedges. I'm a research scientist with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, so Fisheries and Oceans Canada, we different different names, same thing. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the research that my program does on marine fishes and fisheries in the Arctic. So we have uh, several research areas. We do biodiversity surveys to look at fish and invertebrate communities throughout the Arctic. We do stock assessments to um, have an understanding of the, the health of populations of Greenland halibut, northern and striped shrimp, and most recently redfish. We've got a, a new one on our plate. Uh, we also look at fishery interactions. So when people are out fishing commercially, they never catch just one thing. So we're always looking at um, bycatch species and two of particular interest because of their life history. They're, they're um, slow growing, long lived species are Greenland shark and Arctic skate. And just to better understand our species, we're always doing some fundamental fish ecology research as well, just to better understand the habitat use of individual species, their movement patterns, uh, some of the food web structure, so who's eating who, and just an, a better idea of the community composition and the interactions among species in those communities. So in the Canadian Arctic, we have offshore commercial fisheries and an inshore commercial fishery. And there are, as was mentioned, uh, some interest in developing fisheries. So offshore, we have fisheries for Greenland halibut and northern and striped shrimp. And then we have a, a single commercial fishery for Greenland halibut that's in, in an inshore area. So offshore in Baffin Bay, um, all of the green area is, you know, technically areas that people can fish for Greenland halibut. Uh, the orange outline 
is really where most of the fishery happens. So it happens offshore in, in deeper water and they're fishing for uh, a Greenland halibut using primarily bottom trawls, but also some gill netting and a very little bit of long lining. And then in Cumberland Sound, the community of Pangerton near the south end of Baffin Island, so in this yellow box, uh, they also fish for Greenland halibut and they sell the fish commercially. The, the fishery there is mostly done in the winter. So people go out and fish through the sea ice. They cut a hole and set a long line. Uh, there has been recently some effort to develop a commercial fishery there in the summer as well. Just they don't always catch their full quota in the winter. So people have started trying to use boats in the summer to, to catch uh, some of the remaining quota. Whereas offshore, it's all vessel based. We also have fisheries for northern and striped shrimp. Uh, again, there's a large area where people can legally fish for it. So all of the pink area. But most of the fishing happens in this orange um, polygon, orange shape at the, the south end. So the, the shrimp are, are more concentrated further south. There's It's a higher productive area. And uh, the boats can catch their full quota without having to travel as far as if they were going up to the northern extent. So most of the fishing happens in the south area. We also have three communities that have been actively trying to develop commercial fisheries. So Kikitarjuak down at the south um, has been trying to develop fisheries for Greenland halibut. They also have large clam beds and there's a lot of shrimp in the area. So they're exploring a few different options. Uh, often the limitation is not so much whether there are animals there, it's, it's trying to get them caught into market, processed in, in some place they can sell. And because of the remoteness of the communities, you know, shipping is, is often costs a lot. So there's a, you know, economic challenges to it, but anything they catch, there's also um, can be eaten locally as well. So there's, you know, just because it's commercial doesn't mean it's necessarily going internationally or even to Southern Canada that it can be sold locally as well. And so then Clyde river down here um, does some, they've been doing some test fishing in fjords north of their community. Uh, primarily for Greenland halibut and the same thing Pond Inlet at the north end of Baffin Island uh, has been working on developing a, a commercial fishery for Greenland halibut there. Although they also have, um, from our surveys, a fair bit of shrimp in the area, though not the same species that's fished in Davis Strait. So fisheries are important to Arctic communities because they're one of the few potential jobs that people can develop um, in these areas. There's a lot of traditional work. People still live a fairly traditional lifestyle. There's a lot of hunting. There's a lot of fishing for, for personal use. And some of that has translated into people developing their own guiding companies. So they, you know, they will take tourists out to, you know, view animals, to do some fishing, um, potentially you know, for, for hunting, I guess, as well, though it's more fishing and, and just observation. And people, of course, develop, make their own clothing from natural, you know, from sealskin clothes, uh, sealskins, um, they make boots, coats, uh, they make tools, handcrafts, art. A lot of it is still used locally. Uh, and it's, you know, the, a lot of the synthetic materials are not as waterproof or as warm as, as wearing the, the clothes they're getting off of the animals that they're hunting for their own food use as well. And, but they also, you know, there'll be local economies where people trade or sell um, some of their, their craft, their, their, their um, homemade products in town and among communities and to a, a slightly growing extent, you know, outside of communities as well. There are very few stores. There are no, no, like there are no malls in communities. There would be uh, you know, one or two grocery stores, a North, North Martin, a co-op. There might be one of those might have a small satellite store in town that's like a little convenience store that's open a little bit longer, but really not that many jobs there. Some jobs at the elementary school and high school, some jobs working for the town council. So the hamlet, um, maintaining some of the, the infrastructure and looking after utilities in town and in the airport. But that's that's about it. And most of those jobs are very static. There's not new positions. So even as you know, populations are growing, the number of jobs really doesn't change except for things like fishing. So it's a, it's an important economic opportunity, but needs to be done in a sustainable way. And so for our surveys, uh, most of our surveys, we use a bottom trawl and the trawl is, is, is a sort of our, our best option because it collects a variety of fishes and, and invertebrates. So it allows us to do biodiversity monitoring, uh, 
And in a lot of cases for the inshore, the first time we go to a location, it is the first survey that's been done in the area. Uh, so we are collecting what we consider baseline biodiversity data, and that would be used to compare any future changes from climate change or human development to see how the communities, um, fish and invertebrate communities and the environment are changing through time. We also use the data for stock assessments to manage harvested populations. So we assess population health and try to provide advice on how much fishing is sustainable in the long term. So our surveys, we have a, a vessel on the surface. Um, so in this case, it's you know, picturing our offshore trawling vessel. And the trawl, it, the net is right on the bottom. There are two large metal doors, and these will weigh often several tons that run along the bottom and they, uh, they, they push against, the, they, the water pressure pushes them out. So they keep the net spread open. They act as a weight that keeps the trawl on the bottom. And then these wings, these triangular pieces, uh, basically help to they funnel fish, herd fish into the rest of the net. And then so anything that the net gets swept across uh, will end up in the in the trawl. We bring the trawl up and we see what we caught. So the, to give you an actual picture of the trawl, this is the offshore vessel we've used for our trawling surveys so far. And the boat's owned by Greenland, but we charter it every year. And so the, the green is the mesh of the trawl. These black pieces um, are actually chunks of tire. They're cut out of very large tires and they run along the bottom of the ocean. So it, it helps keep the trawl from getting caught on rocks and, and, uh, and minimizes the, the damage that it does to the like, disturbance to the bottom. And the, and the, then these round balls are floats. So they're on the top part of the net and they help open the net up. So there's weight on the bottom, there's flotation on the top, and that opens the trawl up as it goes across the bottom. And we can see here, so this would be the mouth of the trawl, all these black rings are the pieces of tire. And you can see the trawl that we use is quite large. Uh, commercial trawls are actually bigger than what we use for the survey, but this is still a, a substantial size trawl. And so when the trawl comes in, it gets piled up on the deck like this. And there's a hatch right here that opens up and all the, the trawl is dumped into it. So the, the catch goes into it. And then below decks, we sort the catch. So we will have uh, a sorting station. So across the back wall is the bin that the fish get dumped into. And then as they come down this belt, we sort the species. So most of the small fish and invertebrates get sorted into bins along the side. And then our Greenland halibut, which is uh, the largest and most numerous fish we typically catch, uh, falls into baskets at the end and then we process them later. Inshore, we do basically the same thing, but with a smaller boat and a smaller trawl. So this is the, the trawl, rather than being on the deck in a chute, it's on a drum up above our heads. And again, these yellow balls are the floats and the black discs are the part on the bottom that runs over the seafloor. And so we let the trawl out and you can see it's um, sort of stretch, oops, stretches out. It's not quite triangular at this point uh, because of the current, but you can see the, the yellow floats at the mouth and then the trawl extending back there to the, the small point, which is called the caught end. And when it comes in, so the trawl, this is again on the small boat, you can see the, the, net, the net is on the drum above our heads. This is the caught end. So it's the tapered part at the back end of the trawl we bring it in. Uh, we don't need a large bin, smaller boat, smaller bet, smaller trawl, smaller catch. So usually one or two of these, these fish pans will hold what we catch. And so we dump all the catch into it. We check through the net to make sure that we've caught, gotten everything out, and then we'll process what we caught. Uh, in addition to the fish that we're catching and invertebrates, we also want to have an idea of the ecosystem around them. So we have sensors on the trawls that collect information on uh, the, the, the temperature verify the depth and the, the salt contents of the salinity of the water. But we also do zooplankton tows to catch some of the food that the fish would be eating. So these get dropped off the side of the boat on by a crane. Uh, we lower them to about 200 meters and then bring it back up again. The, this little torpedo piece in the middle is a flow meter. So it actually, uh, the propeller at the back end spins around as it comes to the surface. So we, from that, we can calculate how much water we've actually sampled with the trawl of the, the net as it comes up. 
And then we'll hoist it up out of the water. We wash it down with a hose from the outside because small things tend to stick to the net fairly well. So we wash it down and the same thing, it comes down to a taper and then we there's a little cup at the bottom we take off with the, the sample. And so that gives us an idea of the food that's available for the fish that we're, we're catching in the bottom trawl. So to just quickly run through some of the species we catch. So this is a small Greenland halibut. Uh, so that's the, the main commercial species for fishes. We have um, some Atlantic poachers, an eel pout, um, a polar sculpin. So this, the sculpins are really cool in that they, the fins on their belly, they actually make a suction cup. So they will stick to your hand as you're trying to sort through them. They'll stick to the, the table where we're sorting them. And in the water, they will stick to rocks. So it helps them stay in place without spending much energy. Uh, we also catch small skates. Uh, again, another eel pout species, a threadfin rockling, and then Arctic cod, which is the main forage fish in this area. So in Arctic fisheries, uh, you know, we think about Atlantic cod are very large fish that people eat. Uh, Arctic cod are, are quite small. Um, they'll be, you know, the size of a, of a grown-up's thumb. And they are, they're the main, main food for larger fishes and marine mammals. So whales, uh, tooth whales. In addition to the fish, of course, we catch invertebrates. So we catch shrimp. Um, this is just a few different species. Uh, the, the pink shrimp, these larger ones, are uh, what the, the commercial fishery is based on. So there's a northern and a striped shrimp that get larger. And we also catch rock shrimp. So these ones down at the bottom middle, they live right on the bottom. They're quite tasty. Uh, they, they're not fished commercially in our waters, but people will catch them for subsistence and we get them in our biodiversity surveys. Uh, there are also sea urchins and sea spiders. Uh, the sea spiders look somewhat terrifying, but they actually move really slowly. And uh, I think you'd, you'd be hard pressed to get hurt by one. We catch sea cucumbers, uh, the occasional squid. There is squid we don't catch uh, as well because they're not typically right on the bottom. So our trawl runs right on the bottom of the ocean, whereas the squid are, are up in the water. We also get basket stars, so up at the top right, and uh, we get a variety of different types of jellyfish. Wherever we go, there are jellyfish. They are throughout the Arctic seas. So we also, in some areas, do we fish long lines as part of our survey. So in addition, in comparison to the trawl, where the trawl sweeps across the bottom and, and catches any fish that are in front of it, the long line we set out and we let it fish for several hours. So the way it, it's configured is there's a, an anchor on each end with a rope that goes up to the surface and two floats. So we can use those to find it and retrieve the trawl. And along the bottom, there's a weighted rope that lies right on the ocean floor that has a number of hooks that come off it. And the hooks we typically bait with pieces of squid. And then any hungry fish will come by, grab one of the hooks, uh, grab the squid and, and get hooked. So it's very selective in that we can, if we use a small hook, we can get smaller fish. If we use bigger hooks, we select for larger species or larger individuals. Um, so it can be a, um, there, it's a much, we don't get nearly the, the diversity of animals we see on the, in the trawls. <coughs> it's also a bit more labor intensive to set up. We have to bait all of the hooks we set out. So we have these trawl tubs and all this black line is the weighted line that sits on the bottom. And as we go through them, we take, so there's a whole bunch of swivels. Uh, they're about two meters apart on the line. Each one of those has a, has a little line that comes off it that has a hook on the end. You can see this one sticking off the side. And so we put a piece of squid on the hook and we make this big coil and this pile of bait in the tub. And then we set the long line over the side. And most of the time what we're, what we're looking for and what we're catching are Greenland halibut. So when the line comes in, it comes up the side of the ship, we bring the fish over the side, but we also, there is still some bycatch. So we catch the occasional Greenland shark. And unfortunately, typically when we find a shark, um, because they're strong enough and heavy enough, they will lift the ground line off the, so this, this weighted line, the ground line, off the bottom of the floor, seafloor, and it'll tangle. So we will get knots. So there's a lot of, a lot of experience untangling knots with uh, any sort of fishing where you're using lines. And they, it's uh, sometimes we get really 
well, this is a pretty big snarl. You can see right there, even a few fish that are that are caught into it. So they were obviously hooked. Um, and then the shark came along and uh, lifted the line and allowed it to tangle up on itself. Uh, we also catch grenadier occasionally on them. So this is another deep sea fish. You can see it's got a very large eye uh, that allows it to uh, see in very low light conditions. And we do get the occasional non-fish bycatch. We get some sea pens. Um, we get some sea stars. We get um, sponge, whelk, basket stars, some cnidarians, a variety of things. Most of them are hooked incidentally. Uh, so there, it's not that they're, although these little guys are just holding onto the line when we get them. Um, and the sea stars will often have, they'll be wrapped, they'll wrap themselves around the bait. But other things, it's just as we're bringing the line in and it slides across the ocean floor, a hook happens to catch something. So when we catch the animals, we, of course, we don't just want to know what we caught, but we want to have some information about the individual animals. So we record the individual length, um, their weight. From we also the total number of fish of each species caught or invertebrate of each species caught, the total weight for the species within each catch. And some species we will die, do, or some specimens we will do dissections. So from fish, we'll take aging structures. So that typically we take otoliths, which are their, their, their ear stones, analogous to our ear bones. And we'll take tissue samples for genetic analyses and food web analyses. So we can look at the the, some of the, the stable isotopes in the, the tissue to have an idea of who is eating whom. And it's a fish eat fish world. So we're not the only ones out there trying to catch fish. The Sometimes what we catch, occasionally we only bring it ahead. In this case, it's a Greenland halibut that was bitten three times, maybe four, looks like three, by a Greenland shark. And for whatever reason, it didn't bite all the way through so the fish actually when we took it off the line it looked more like a ribbon but when we laid it down and put it together nothing was missing but these crescent cuts are definitely bites from a greenland shark so in addition to doing our surveys where we're catching fish for some of the ecology work we want to know where fish are moving how the you know if they're moving between fishing areas if they're using different types of habitat different times of year uh, as there's slowly mine development or more shipping in the Arctic, are fish using areas that, that those activities are going to happen in? Uh, are they there all year round at different times of the year? So it, having a better idea of the habitats and the timing of when fish are in areas and when they move can help us provide advice on ways to minimize impacts on fishes. So we the best way we can do that is by tagging individuals so we use satellite tags um, which are very expensive <laughs> they can cost several thousand dollars and so we know we catch a fish we know where we caught it we put a satellite tag onto it uh, we release the fish and the satellite tag will come off on a will will program a date when it's supposed to release from the fish and for um throughout its duration it usually most of the tags we use record the water temperature and the depth that it's at and so we have an idea of the type of water that the fish was in while it was um, at liberty and then on the date programmed the tag releases comes to the surface connects to a satellite and transmits all of its data as well as its current location so we get you know we know where we tagged it we know where the tag came off um, but we don't really know how it got between those two locations, unless by chance it comes to the surface. Uh, people use the same tags on marine mammals, and they can get tracks of where the mammal, where the whales have gone. But that's because they're coming to the surface, and so when these tags get to the surface, they will always locate themselves and try to talk to a satellite. Uh, we have more recently started using some of these. These are a smaller satellite tag that don't record any data. They just uh, they just when they pop off same thing we record the date the release they come to the surface and they just say i'm you know talk to a satellite and, and get the coordinates so we don't get any data in between but we know where we tagged it where it came off and they're smaller so we have been able to put you know multiple tags onto a shark um, the other fish are, are too small to put multiple tags on but in that way we can have them programmed to come off at intervals and have an idea of you know every week where did the shark go to so you still don't know the exact path but you can get a bit more detail than just having one large expensive satellite tag on it 
Uh, we also put out put acoustic tags into the animals. So these are depicted going into the body cavity. And they so we have to do surgery to put them into the fish. And then so they we um, anesthetize the fish for sharks, we roll them onto their back. We uh, you know, make a small incision, put the tag in, suture it up, uh, make sure the animal is recovered and then let them go. These rely on the fish swimming past instruments that we put in the ocean to detect them. So these are sending it a, a, an acoustic pulse every few seconds that is unique to that tag. And as these fish swim past one of our moorings, which we put in strategic locations, uh, so near different you know, borders of fishing areas, inside some fjords, uh, habitats of interest, then as the fish swim by there, they the, that serial number and the time and, and date gets recorded. So we know that that specific fish was in that area. And in some cases, how long it was there, if it stays, and we get multiple detections. And we also use uh, just very inexpensive plastic tags that go on the outside of the fish. And we use them on Greenland halibut and sharks as well. And it just has a, a unique number and a phone number. Uh, and a name. So if when people catch one of those fish, they can see the tag and they can call us. The satellite tags and the acoustic tags also have identifying information on them so people can call us with the tags. And then we pay a reward if we get the tag back. Um, and that's really the only way we get information with those plastic tags is someone calls us, we get the information and we pay them a reward for providing that, that data. So the data are that come from all of this work is used both nationally and internationally. And so uh, part of my work is related to the Central Arctic Ocean and, and, uh, and just Arctic fish biodiversity in general. So there's recently been signed an agreement to prevent commercial fishing in the high seas portion. So this uh, within the green polygon, it's kind of hard to see out of here, I guess. Um, so outside of countries, waters, there's, uh, so there's a 16-year moratorium on fisheries development until we have a science program in place and collect enough information to identify which species are there. We have some ideas uh, based on surveys that have happened in the edges of the area and in adjacent waters, so in countries' waters, but we haven't really surveyed in the Central Arctic Ocean itself too much. Um, so I have a good idea of what's present, um, identify the links between species, so the, the food web dynamics and then identify any you know, likely impacts of commercial fishery development on not just the target species, but on the ecosystem itself. And then in the in Canadian context, so that again, the research supports our sustainable management of fisheries, biodiversity monitoring, but also conservation. Uh, so the, the data we have on fish distributions and their habitat use, and habitat characteristics from the, the sensors we put out on the trawls and, and just in other ways on our moorings um, has supported the development of uh, conservation areas in Baffin Bay and Davis Strait. So recently we had three new uh, conservation areas that were developed that contributed towards Canada's um, international obligations for developing 20% of our waters by, by 2020. And of course, as scientists, we don't make the decisions ourselves. We provide science advice. And so we provide that to fisheries management or fish habitat management within DFO. Uh, we also provide advice to our minister, so to the political level. And ultimately it's, the, you know, the, it's those management groups and the minister that make decisions, but we provide um, our advice based on the best information we have available. And with that, I think I will stop and take any questions. All right, let's bring that back up on the screen. Kevin, thank you so much for that great uh, presentation, that great look into the work that you do uh, out in the field, uh, the methods you use to, to sample, and of course, uh, the tracking of those amazing Arctic species. Um, those who are tuning in live via YouTube, you can send your questions in via the chat. Uh, and then we'll visit our camera crew as well and see if they have some questions for us. So Mr. Tompkins' crew is in Ottawa, Ontario, some grade seven, eight students. Let's bring them in uh, and see if they have a question oh. for us. Hi, hi everyone. Um, we don't have a question at this time, but we wanted to say thank you. It actually is now our lunch period, so we may have to leave at this time, but we wanted to say thank you so much for the presentation. It's 
really great to see uh, science in the field in real life and to experience the different uh, opportunities out there. So thanks so much. And everyone all together, let's say thank you. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's grab a question here from the YouTube chat. This is from... Uh, looks like Mrs. Thomas's class in Alaska. And they're wondering, you know, some of those pictures of the, the, the different animals from the sculpin, uh, to the skates look pretty bizarre. So they're wondering what's, what in your opinion is the most bizarre, uh, marine species you pulled up from the bottom. Uh, yeah, that's, I would say the, the weirdest looking one is the grenadier with the, the big eyes. They are, yeah, truly, truly interesting animals. Um, and they live so so deep down. They don't, um, unfortunately, they don't do very well coming to the surface. Whereas Greenland halibut are quite happy, but they, yeah, they look very alien. All right, very cool. Another question here coming in via YouTube looks like from Mister Pui is how old do the Greenland sharks live up to? Ah, uh, great question. So the we don't know exactly um but certainly several hundred years there's been there a few years ago there was a, a study where people did look at the try to estimate the age of greenland sharks uh, and they were getting to the point where you know they could be four seven hundred years old we're never when you get that far back in time it's never precise uh, yeah. there's always a lot of error but but hundreds of years so the we've had a couple of sharks that not in my project but in general in the science community that were caught, tagged, released, and then recaptured a few years later. And, and from that little bit of information we have, it looks like they grow at about one centimeter, cent, grow one centimeter a year uh, when they're immature. So once they get mature, that could slow down even more. So, you know, the, a lot of the sharks we're catching, and they're when they're they're a little bit less than a meter when they're born. So that if you figure they grow a centimeter a year. A lot of the sharks that we see are two, three, four centimeters long. Uh, those could be, you know, again, you know, several, two, three, four hundred years old. Wow. And they grow to be about seven, seven meters long. So they wow. they are truly ancient species. Yeah, let's build on that just a little bit more, Kevin. Just in general, that that cold water of the Arctic. What kind of effect does that have on the growth uh, of just marine species in general. Yeah, so it's uh, for for fishes uh, and invertebrates in particular that are you know their their body temperature they don't regulate it on their on their own in general. It's you know it's the temperature of the water that's around them. So as the water gets colder, their metabolic rate slows down. So they it means they're not burning energy as fast. They're not uh, so everything slows down. They grow slower. They they digest their food slower. Um, it, it's like you're just, you're putting everything onto, on just a slower speed. And the colder it gets, the the slower things go as far as the metabolic rate to, to a point where eventually it's too cold. Um, often, you know, if things start to freeze, of course, then the cells just rupture. But, and then the, the, the flip side is, of course, as it gets warmer, their metabolic rates pick up again and it, and it gets, um, everything goes faster. But for a lot of our deep sea species, they're in the Arctic, they're so deep, like a lot of our, our inshore fishing we're doing in 800 meters or less, which is, you know, you, it's almost a kilometer. The, the Greenland halibut fishery is really happening. Most of it is deeper than that. It's 700 meters down to 15, 1600 meters. So you're going more than a kilometer down. And at that point, there's no light um, and the water temperature is very constant. So there's not, you know, usually you think about our lakes in, in Ontario or Manitoba or just in temperate areas uh, and in anything, most lakes, you know, you see temperature changes through the season. And, and we see that in the surface of the Arctic Ocean uh, and in oceans in general. But by the time you get down to the, the truly deep habitats, the water temperature is very constant. It doesn't change very much. The only way you really see changes in temperature is by swimming up and down in the water column. And there will be layers of water at different temperatures. Uh, but the bottom is very constant. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring you, we've got a homeschool group hanging out with us. Uh, Kala and Elise, I'm going to bring them in to see if they have a question for us. Maybe if you're able to hear me, okay, uh, to unmute the mic and we'll, we'll grab a question from you if you have one. Oh, 
Oh, I see something in the private chat. Let me check. Okay. Uh, let me grab uh, some more questions from the YouTube chat here. So this is another good one here. The fish that you catch when you're doing these surveys, uh, are they released? Are they kept? And are you able to, you know, maybe give them to, to people for food? What happens to those fish? Yeah, so it depends on the survey. So our inshore surveys that are happening near communities, um, well, obviously any of the fish that we tag, they're they're alive. We're we're you know we're doing our measurements, we're tagging them, we're putting them back in the water, and so for a lot of our inshore surveys, that's been most of the fish we've been tagging. Um, we can't afford to put satellite tags on everything or even acoustic tags in all of them, but uh, the Floyd tags are about three cents a piece. So, and the, because it relies on people recapturing them, we put Floyd tags in pretty much everything. So a lot of that, those fish are alive when we, when we release them. And um, anything that is dead that, or is in too rough a condition, like it's been bitten or it's been, it was damaged when it came onto the ship. Um, sometimes the jaw gets broken. Then uh, in those cases, those are the fish we take tissue samples from. And whenever we're working near a, a community, we, I, I try to hire people from the community as part of the science crew. So in most cases, we'll have two people from the local community on board and we provide the fish to them. So that's, we can't sell it. Uh, we know we're not trying to make money at this. It's a science survey, but absolutely. Like we, the, some of the shrimp that's caught, people will, will get taken back to the local community. Uh, and it goes to the, to the hunters and trappers organization or hunters and trappers association. And so that's a group in the community that, that helps with food sharing and they have a community freezer. Uh, so it is anything that's, that can be used uh, is, is taken in that way. And we rely on the, the people from the community that are part of our, of our crew to use their judgment as to what's worth taking back. You know, if, if no one's going to eat it, there's no point in taking it back. It's just a waste of freezer space and energy. Uh, but if there is someone's going to use it, absolutely. It goes to a community for the offshore survey. It's it's a different story. We're not near communities. Uh, there's really no place we could drop it off. We still can't sell it. Uh, but in that case, the the Greenland crew will often keep some of the fish that we that we're killing. And for it, we do um, we do sex and maturity, so we have to open up some of the fish and look at that. So there's definitely more fish killed in the offshore survey than in our inshore ones. But again, you know, it's if someone can make use of it, absolutely. We don't sell it, but if it can be used, all the better. All right. And then, yeah, so this, you know, taking these samples, um, it really does help inform important decisions. You know, how healthy the fishery is. Uh, can it be opened up? Should certain areas be protected? So there's definitely, you know, a lot you can learn from these surveys. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, and particularly as we see, you know, we, we all hear about climate change. We all see climate change these days happening around us. And and a lot of the, the the only way that we can judge what the impacts of climate change are or development, like new mines, new shipping routes, uh, that are all possibilities as the Arctic is becoming more and more ice free for more of the year. You know, we we can't judge those those changes without seeing what's there in the first place. So we can't go back in time, but we can certainly, you know, we can collect a, what we consider a contemporary baseline of that's what's here now. And, and try to get an idea of the interactions, which is where the food web analysis really comes in, to then see if those change. You know, as, as we get um, species from temperate waters slowly moving up into Arctic waters, how does that change the food web? What are the threats? Um, certainly, you know, are those, if, if species come up, are they, uh, is it, you know, opportunities for new fisheries for Arctic communities? Or are they just problematic? Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways it gets used, absolutely. And and a big one in the most in the few years, the last few years, and going forward right now, there's a there's a large push for protecting more areas, developing more aquatic protected areas. So a lot of our data is going to support those activities and to do it in a meaningful way. You know, protect areas that are useful, not just for the sake of closing an area and meeting a target. Yeah. So Kevin, there's there's massive fishery fleets, you know, from around the world, often traveling very far from the countries that uh you know they originated from is that a problem in northern waters are there um you know ships uh from other countries in the area and and maybe fishing illegally uh there there are international boats that come into baffin bay so the our fishery is managed in conjunction with greenland 
So we're on the west side of Baffin Bay and Davis Strait. Greenland is on the east side. We use a Greenland vessel for our survey because it's the same boat they use. And that way we can combine our data and do a, a joint analysis because it's it's one population. The fish are moving back and forth. They don't respect the international boundary. And uh, historically, before Canada started fishing in Baffin Bay, there were vessels from Germany and Russia, other countries that would come in and fish in the area. Uh, now in our waters, it's mostly Canadian vessels. Um, there is some harvest by, by other countries in Greenland waters, but it's all reported. And um, the, 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 our conservation and protection group in DFO, you know, they do aerial surveillance flights. They, have, um, they monitor the vessel tracking systems. Boats at sea these days, everything has a GPS. They're all, um, and most of them have a, a tracking system that, that goes to a, a central database that can be accessed real time. So they can watch where vessels are, particularly when they're looking at con like the conservation areas. Does anyone steam through them? If they go, if they do go through it, you know, they call the ship and find out well, what are you doing? You know, it's yeah, you might be able to travel through there, but we want to make sure you're not you're not fishing that you didn't miss the line or whatever. And uh, so there's a fair bit of in domestic waters, a fair bit of observation that goes on. the The concern about um, illegal fishing and impacts of of international fleets is really what drove that Central Arctic Ocean Agreement for the the 16 year moratorium that's now in place in that it's you know it doesn't fall under anyone's jurisdiction it's not part of it's outside the boundaries of of all of the bordering countries to the Central Arctic Ocean it's outside of the any of the fisheries agreements that currently exist we have a the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization covers off what happens off of the, the east coast of Canada and Greenland. Our, our Baffin Bay areas are all NAFO areas, and but it, it doesn't go up into the Central Arctic Ocean. And there's another agreement to the Northeast Atlantic that again doesn't go into the Central Arctic Ocean or not very far anyway. So there's a there's no management scheme. There's no there were no agreements in place, and and as it gets open, you know, it's we're seeing um, less and less ice at the, 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 the peak of the summer every year. And as that's opening up, um, you know, there's more opportunities for shipping. And it was just, you know, we, there was this international desire to put in place a, an agreement so that no one's going to go in. It's, and that agreement includes Canada, US, Russia, Iceland, Norway, um, the European Union, uh, Denmark for Greenland and the Faroe Islands, China, uh, South Korea, Japan, I think that was the 10. And hopefully I didn't miss anyone. Um, but anyway, but so it's it's the the 10 countries or 10 groups that would be most likely to to be fishing in the area if if it opened up. And so all of this, all those countries coming together to sign an agreement and to develop a science body to start collecting data. So right now we're still in the the planning phase of of how we're going to collect the data. But in the next couple of years, hopefully we will be doing surveys in the area to really you know, we have a lot of assumptions, but until we go and actually do surveys, um, video surveys, trawling surveys, whatever, uh, and we're still trying to figure out what, what is the best way to do that uh, without having a, a negative impact on the area um, unduly, then, um, you know, it's it's great that there's not fishing starting in advance of us. To, you know, an, an effort to do it right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kevin, to wrap us up today, um, more questions about what's coming in via those surveys. So uh, two questions to wrap us up. The sea, the sea spiders, I, I think those are called <laughs> pictogonins. Do they bite? They do not, no. Right. And, and they, you know, they, they look terrifying and they will be like sometimes as big as my hand. But it, it would be like, you know, they, they, they stand there and then they slowly move. So you know, they're... They're, they're, I think they'd be great for a horror film just because of the, you know, the way they look and they move in such a slow way. You keep expecting them to suddenly lunge forward and grab your face, but they don't. Um, they're perfectly harmless. All right. And then the final question here is uh, the rarest uh, species that's come up in one of the tests, one of the trolls. Oh, uh, the rarest. That... For for us for our science surveys, I, I guess I would say um, uh, wolf fishes. So we we do get them occasionally. Uh, I've only ever caught 
four myself in the last 10 years, 11 years. And they are, they look kind of like the eel pouts in that they've, they've got an eel shaped body, but they're, um, and there are three species in our area, but uh, we've caught one um, Atlantic wolf fish and three spotted and sorry, one Northern and three spotted, uh, something like that. And uh, they've got monstrous teeth. Um, so the eel pouts are, you know, they, they, again, they can't hurt you. They've got these little mouths and they look very friendly. Um, the wolf fish are, they live in rocky areas, which is why we don't get a lot of them. The trawl doesn't fish well in those areas. Uh, but they come up and they've got these big teeth, like the the northern wolf fish looks like it has dentures in its mouth, actually. And again, the first time I thought it, I thought it was a faked photograph. Uh, but they and they've got really strong jaws, so they can latch onto you, and then you know, it's hard to get them off. So we're always very careful, but we don't see a lot of them. And they are um, they, there's something we monitor as, as species at risk in southern waters. So it's uh, uh, I'm glad we don't catch a lot of them. And there's no no real suggestion they've declined in our area, but they are they're very cool. Um, again, kind of scary when you see the teeth coming facing your direction. But again, it's it's cold water. Their bodies are cold, so they're still not. It's not like they're lunging at you. They don't move sure. very fast. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I want to start off with a shout out to our classrooms today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for all of those great questions. And then Kevin, of course, thank you so much for letting us steal a little bit of your time and getting a little peek. Uh, into the fisheries work that you're doing in the in the Arctic with so many just cool species who I think are just off the radar of so many students uh, living in other parts of Canada. My pleasure. I'm happy to do this. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. We're going to sign off uh, for today. Have a great weekend. And hopefully we see you in events coming up later in November uh, and December as well. Thanks, everyone.